In today's video, we are taking a look to see if we can make our own bread out of rye that we've gathered ourselves. Guys, today we're here with Joseph and Joseph from the channel Good and Basic, and they are going to be helping us out with a fun experiment. We're going to see if we can make bread from roadside weeds. Here's the basic idea. We have Joseph and Joseph with us today, and they are going to show us how to harvest fresh rye. After that, we're going to see if we can turn it into bread. Yeah. What am I holding right now? You are holding wild cereal rye. This is actually cereal the same rye. kind of rye that people have used for thousands of years to make bread. And it's not actually native here to the Western United States where we're filming, but it is, it has escaped. <laughs> so from farms, you know, 150 years ago, some rye got away and now you can see that it has gotten away and become very successful. Wow. And uh, it grows alongside the highway basically everywhere. It's literally all over the place. And the crazy thing about this wild weed is that it's food. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna harvest some, we're gonna uh, harvest the grains off, we're gonna bash it a whole bunch of times to get the grain to fall out of the straw, and then we're gonna make bread. We're All actually right. gonna introduce you to both the scythe, uh, which is like the higher tech version, and also the sickle, which is like going to old school. Higher tech right here. Look at this, look at this high tech. Everything's relative, man. Oh yeah, Except this for the is... Things that aren't. This is straight up. Okay, so this is the seed head. Um, the straw you can't eat. I, I don't recommend you trying unless you're truly desperate. Or a cow. But if you kind of break that down with your fingers, you can see that little grains fall out. Oh, cool. So this little bit right here, the part of the head that is not grain, is called chaff. We don't want that. So there's a whole process for getting rid of that. But what we're gonna do is, with a lot of blunt force trauma, we're going to remove those grains. And you can actually eat them like right now. So if you want to take a pinch of those and are they good? Absolutely. I want to decent. try this. Yeah. Um, may or may not have snacked on this a time or two while I'm, you know, on a walk with my family. That's really fun. Yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That is a bill hook. Um, this is it's a bill actually, hook. This is my new favorite thing. This is something that people would use to trim branches back before uh, whoppers and shears were a thing. Okay. But it works really well as a sickle, so we're going to use it for both. Fantastic. And you were showing us earlier. We we're just getting a really quick demonstration. Yeah, we're just letting him do his own thing. <laughs> it's not what Nate's doing in the background. It's not just like hitting it. You are actually pulling yes. with it. And that, that cutting motion is what's actually just allowing it, you to not really have to put exactly. a lot of work into it. Awesome. And you made this one? I did. This is fantastic. Do you guys see this? Yeah, there's a giant blood circle on that side. We better stay like 10 feet away. Is that what it's called, the blood circle? Oh yeah, like a blood circle. Like if you're cutting wood, mm -hmm. uh, then what's called the blood circle is, is it's an area around you where it's a, it's a safety uh, measure so that you, you, you want to like stay this. far enough away. So if, if, I'm, if I'm this close, I'm inside his blood circle and my head's coming off. So See, for mine, I knew that with swords. Like I this. didn't know it was all blades, so that's cool. That's my blood circle. <laughs> okay, so the way this thing works is you grab it mm -hmm. and then you go under where your hand is and you just pull. And that is how the sickle works. I love it. Traditionally, this is done in this horrid squatting position, working your way like this across <laughs> a field. <laughs> And you can see why that's an upgrade. I'm gonna go ahead and not do that. Yeah, we also don't want the whole straw for today's video. We probably just want the seed heads. And so okay, if so you I'm just, just wanna... going around to the top parts of things and just grabbing them and pulling, and exactly. that's what I'm doing. And throwing that in the bucket. I love it. All right, let's get started. I think we've gathered all of the rye that we're gonna need for today, so we're gonna head back to the studio and see what it takes to turn it into bread. Okay, we've got a bunch of this wheat, but I think that our wheat has quite a bit of stuff we don't want on it, like the stock part, and <laughs> you were showing us all of the sort of husk that comes off of the seed itself. Now we are going to need to get all of the good parts of the seed out of everything else. Yes, and the process for that is called threshing. Um, incidentally, the word thrash, like if you're gonna give somebody a good thrashing, meaning a beating, um, that's where that comes from, is just repeatedly whacking the straw until all the grains fall out. Is that why you have a stick? Yes. Okay. Joseph here has a more advanced stick. It looks a lot like a drill. It rotates. It's a rotary stick. This a is a great stick. thing. Mine rotates too. It just doesn't do anything when you rotate it. <laughs> it's not a very advanced process. That's it? You just whack it a whole bunch. <laughs> Stirring it up real quick. The way that they used to do it is I we'd make a this. big mound of the hay, of the straw, mm -hmm. and then whack on top of it with a big flail, which is incidentally where nunchucks come from. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm dead serious. Oh my gosh. And 
the, in order to keep your grain from spilling out of your barn as you're thrashing this all winter long, you have a threshold. Okay, yeah. So the threshold of the house is where the, you know, it comes kind of up a little bit near the door. Yeah. And that's to keep things from spilling out. Interesting. Yeah. Good to know. Three hours later. <laughs> this is not quick. I'm not seeing tons. I mean, there's some, there's some grains in there, but it's not like it's just full of loose grain yet. So this is not a five minute process. It took several hours and ended up being super non-productive. So we're going to upgrade to the next version. Let's let Joseph demonstrate. <laughs> That's about it. The oldest. Holy see, cow, so you can start to see a lot out. more of the wow. grains have been knocked free. That's working so, so, so much better. Not all of it has come out. So if I split open this head, you can see there's still another grain in there. And then there's another grain in there. So but there's still a little more threshing to go. But it, The amount of time that that took comparatively is amazing. Oh yeah. So. Okay, so the next stage of this process is called winnowing. So in this bucket, I have two things. I have the chaff, which is the husks and the straw, and then I also have the grain kernels. Now the cool thing is that the grain kernels are heavier than the empty husks. So if you pour them across a moving stream of air, you can use a fan or you could just use the wind, then what will happen is the moving air will blow off the chaff because it's lighter and the grain seeds will fall down into this pot. And then like you said, the chaff even just collects on the top. So I've just grabbed a handful from the top. It's all chaff. Yeah, that grain is barely going half the way back and the chaff gets blown right off. The tricky part, of course, is that the grain isn't that heavy either. And so it can get blown away. And so you just need to monitor it and make sure that you're getting the right amount of airflow, the right height, and also that you're pouring it in the right place. Okay, and at that point, I would say, you just pick out the rest of the chaff by hand. There's just about okay. 15 more pieces, and then nice. there's your grain. Very cool. So Look we can clean that. this that out. We'll get the rest threshed. Fair amount of grain right there. Yeah. We've got rye. Yep. That is amazing. So I don't just eat this with a spoon. You well, could, you can, but you don't necessarily want to. I don't. Literally just grain growing by the side of the road, and we harvested it. Yeah, and awesome. there's literally thousands of acres of this stuff. So what are we gonna do with this? What's your plan? So the plan is to grind this down into flour and then make it into something delicious. Maybe some bread, maybe a pancake or two, and then eat it and see if we like it and see if we die. You great, know, great, like yeah, science. that's All experimental right. eating. Is there a, an old fashioned, old timey method of grinding this up we've got? Yes. Um, you have a mortar and pestle, but. <laughs> That, that's pretty old school. Use a rock with another rock to smash it. That's probably mm -hmm. what happened at first. Then they upgraded and they figured, you know, if you have a rock in kind of a channel, you can rub it back and forth. Okay. That's what and then you it call collects the grains, which is nice. Then you don't have the grains spreading out all over the place. And then somebody got the bright idea of having one that rotates. And that's when you get a corn stone. And we're going to use kind of a modern version of that, just a little hand grinder. All cool. Right. Let's try it. I think it's pretty easy to understand, but yeah. show us anyway. This is a hand crank uh, steel on steel grinder. And I picked it up at a thrift store for 15 bucks. Nice. And it has served me well for many years. And then you just keep going. It's got a little adjusty thingy here. I'm gonna try this way. I'm gonna try two <laughs> different methods at once, okay? I like your method better. Let's have a race, right? Let's okay, see how this racing. goes. Okay, let's go race. We'll just, just gonna move real leisurely here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Keep going, just keep going. No, you, you got no. this, man. I think we're good? I'd say that's about the right consistency. Perfect. I think we won. That is an incredibly fine, beautiful Except I made a mess. rye flower. Be just second time. <laughs> that looks like flour. Looks like flour, sm smells like flour. I would say it's not quite as fine as commercially available flour, and maybe we could get it there if we just kept going for a yeah, little bit. Yeah, just run it for another minute or two. But it's not like sand. Okay, so next thing's next. We need to decide what we're gonna make out of this. Okay. Uh, you were suggesting, you said something about bread. Yeah. And I also heard pancakes. Yes. I think it'd be fun to try both of those. At this point, can we mix our flour, or do you want to not you contaminate your hand ground flour <laughs> with our machine ground flour? Tell you what, I've got a, uh, a batch of bread ready to go uh, from a previously done batch of this stuff. I figure we'll use this for pancakes. All right. Because like they it. don't take eight hours to rise. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, let's, so show us that, and then let's talk about the rising method that you're using and sure. how that came into being. Here's our loaf of dough. There's the dough. This has been rising since last night, and it honestly hasn't risen all that much. It looks 
fairly, it, like it kind of looks cooked oh, at this nice. point. It's, yeah. it's formed a skin as it dried out a little bit, yes. but you can see it is still dough. Well, we're gonna throw this in the oven and cook it for about 25 minutes. Um, the, the method that I used for this is called a sourdough start, and the way that you can get one of those, there's two ways, right? You find someone else who has one, and we'll give you a little sample of theirs, and then it's like a chia pet. You feed it every day with a little bit of wheat and a little bit of water that has no chlorine in it, and then you scoop out a little bit, and that keeps all the yeast colonies and lactobacteria that are in the sourdough start alive. Let me show you the one that I've got. So this is my sourdough start. It's basically flour and water goo. The thing that makes it special though are the millions of microorganisms living inside here, which are the things making these bubbles right here. As they consume some of the sugar from the grain, they produce bubbles, which makes the bread rise and also helps to ferment it, which chemically changes the bread. So the way that you make this, is you either get some from, from me or someone else who gives you a little scoop and that infects your flour and water goo, or you just get some flour, mix some water, and then start treating it as if it was alive. And it will actually get colonized from little yeasts and lactobacteria that are in the air, and also that were initially on the bodies of the grain itself. If you look at the grain super, super closely, you can see that it is alive. And over a couple of weeks, you'll find that it will start to rise just like bread is supposed to. I do love the fact that in that description for food, you used the word infect. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a strange thing. But it's thing. true. <laughs> so on his channel, Good and Basic, they have a video about the sourdough process. You can go watch that if you want to learn more information. At this point, we are going to put this piece of dough in the oven. So we are going to take this flour that we have made and we are going to attempt to make pancakes out of it. We have pancakes. That's a stack of pancakes. Those are pancakes. It is. They were cooked in a pan. They're kind of cake shaped. And a couple hours ago, they were in a field. Yes, they were. Yeah. <laughs> this morning, they were in a that field. It's really weird to think about, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got a few of them. It's maybe a little floppy for a pancake, but that could just be our recipe of what we put in, not necessarily the wheat. We didn't really add any baking soda or anything. I want to just do a quick test of, Yeah. there's butter on this, but nothing else. Want to know what the consistency is like. The inside, I think, is maybe not quite cooked. Not entirely, but it tastes really good. It's close. It's yeah. really close. Exact temperature may be a thing we'd have to experiment with, but... That is a pancake. Tastes like a pancake. So I think if we had... Rich, hearty. A better recipe. Yeah. And, and that's just because we just threw eggs, milk, and a little bit of salt in haphazardly and just said, I don't know, that looks good. <laughs> um, and so we did not get like perfect IHOP style pancakes or something like that. Like Callie was pointing out, we didn't use any baking soda or baking powder or anything like that. But this is great. They taste like they are pancakes. They taste good. So we sliced it up with the intent of cooking out that middle and it seems to be better, but not perfect. Would I eat this on purpose? Yes. If dying. If <laughs> dying. Also if dying, but I was thinking like, in certain conditions and with certain other foods, you were talking like with a sour type soup. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. By yeah. far the biggest issue is the same as with the pancakes. It's just the recipe needs tweaking, mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with the source flour. Yeah. So one of the things that's amazing to me about bread is that you consider all the labor and effort that it used to take using older methods and working by hand to harvest. And between all of us, it was what, four hours, five mm -hmm. hours, six hours of combined man hours in order to make our little loaf and a little stack of pancakes. And then you look at this purchased from the store for $1.50 and it becomes apparent that we live in the future. Oh, I... There's a lid, you need a lid. <laughs> lid. <laughs> Guys, that's not all you know. We've always got more for you to see. Click that box up at the top to go check out our most recent video and we'll see you in the next one. Talk to you then.